I'm Sarah Sweeney. And I'm Carol Myers. With NewsWrap, a summary of some of the news interaffecting LGBTQ communities around the world for the week ending March 9th, 2019. In response to a question at a travel conference in Berlin this week about how safe it is for Jews and LGBTQ people in his country, Tourism Minister Datuk Mohammedin bin Katapi claimed that there are no LGBTQ people in Malaysia. He told German broadcaster Deutsche Welle that, I don't think we have anything like that in our country. The government came under fire earlier this year when it tried to ban Israeli athletes from an international swim meet. The tourism ministry issued a statement less than two days later claiming to clarify Mohammedin's pronouncement by saying that there are no plans for a Malaysia tourism campaign in the LGBTQ community. As the main tourism destination in Asia, the statement added, Malaysia has never and will not do anything to stop our guests based on their sexual orientation, religion, and cultural belief. That's little comfort to Malaysia's homegrown queer citizens, who have been under relentless attack by a number of high-ranking government officials, including the Prime Minister, for the past few years. Police raids on popular queer venues and verbal and physical assaults by thugs against people perceived to be LGBTQ are common. Several government jurisdictions have established so-called change clinics for transgender people. Queer rights activist Numan Afifi told The Advocate that erasure of our existence will not only just trivialize our struggle, but also perpetuate the injustices towards us. Anthony Chong, who advocates for Malaysia's queer, deaf community, told the news outlet that minority communities, not only LGBTQ people, but also people with disabilities and indigenous people, are ashamed at how our ministers run our government. The country's criminal code, a gift from British colonizers to Malaysia's mostly Muslim 32 million people, punishes consenting adults convicted of engaging in same-gender sex with up to 20 years in prison. Lawmakers in Taiwan are being battered by opposing forces as they deliberate some form of legal recognition for the island's same-gender couples. The Constitutional Court ruled in May 2017 that denying civil marriage to gay and lesbian couples was unconstitutional. The judges gave the legislative yuan two years to remedy the situation. If legislators fail to pass the bill before the May 24th deadline this year, the court said that marriage equality would automatically take effect. Groups on the right, led by the anti-queer Happiness of the Next Generation Alliance, are demanding that a separate category outside of marriage be created, which would reflect the majority vote on the issue in ballot measures the group sponsored last November. Local media reported this week that 20 lawmakers from the ruling party and nine minority party members have signed on to a draft bill that would restrict the use of words such as marriage and spouse to heterosexual couples and raise the age of consent for lesbian and gay couples to 20. According to Taiwan News, Canadian diplomat Michael McCullough nevertheless called the island's progress on introducing a marriage bill a win for the people of the world. However, The government is trying to have it both ways. The draft bill submitted by Taiwan's cabinet on February 21st, called the Enforcement Act of Judicial Yuan Interpretation Number 748, doesn't alter the civil code to include same-gender couples, but creates a separate category for them. Activists have suggested that the exhausting fight over anti-queer ballot measures last November has tempered community enthusiasm for a further fight in the Constitutional Court if the final version of the bill fails to extend all the rights of civil marriage to same-gender couples. A U.S. federal judge in Maryland this week eliminated one of two remaining obstacles that have prevented the implementation of Donald Trump's ban on military service by qualified transgender people. U.S. District Judge George Russell III agreed with the Trump administration's claim that because a recent Supreme Court ruling lifted two of the injunctions in California and Washington state, while legal challenges continue in lower courts, there was no reason to keep his injunction in place. According to the ACLU, one active case remains that keeps the trans ban at bay, Doe v. Trump, in a D.C. court. Military service by transgender people is still governed by the Obama-era policy instituted in 2016 that lifted a ban on qualified trans troops and allowed them to seek medical transition care. When asked about this week's lifting of another injunction, Pentagon spokeswoman Jessica Maxwell told CNN that the Defense Department is expected to issue further guidance, which will be forthcoming in the near future. 
While not surprising, ACLU staff attorney Joshua Bell said the Maryland court injunction being lifted is deeply disappointing. Each and every claim made by President Trump to justify this ban can be easily debunked by the conclusions drawn from the Department of Defense's own review process. Catching up on recent U.S. state news, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled unanimously on March 8th that the state's ban on Medicaid coverage for certifiably necessary surgical care for transgender individuals violated the gender identity protections in Iowa's Civil Rights Act. The state's Department of Human Services argued unsuccessfully that the surgeries were cosmetic, reconstructive, or plastic, performed primarily for psychological purposes. Missouri's Supreme Court overruled the lower court dismissal of a lawsuit filed by a transgender male teen who's challenging his school district's refusal to let him use the boys' bathroom and locker room facilities on campus. The high court said that the teen, who's lived as male since the age of nine, has the right to sue under Missouri's Human Rights Act for discrimination based on sex. In a separate ruling issued the same day, the Missouri Supreme Court also opened the door to other lawsuits by gay people charging sex discrimination, even though the state has no specific laws banning bias based on sexual orientation. Tennessee's Attorney General Herbert Slattery, in response to a lawmaker's question in mid-February, confirmed that transgender people are protected by existing legislation criminalizing hate crimes motivated by gender. It's believed to be the first southern state to specifically include transgender people in its hate crime laws. The Colorado House of Representatives passed a bill banning so-called conversion therapy for minors that claims to make queer people straight. Similar bills have repeatedly failed in the Republican-controlled Senate. But now that Democrats have the majority, thanks to the November elections, passage there now seems likely. And the signature of openly gay Governor Jared Polis is a foregone conclusion. It would make Colorado the 16th U.S. state to ban the bogus practice. But a similar proposal has died in the Utah legislature after the Republican governor and GOP lawmakers couldn't agree on whether or not to allow a therapist to counsel a minor about changing sexual orientation while also swearing not to try to do that. And measures to ban bias based on sexual orientation have failed again in both the North Dakota and Nebraska state legislatures. Meanwhile, the mayor of Alaska's second biggest city vetoed an ordinance this week that was approved by the city council to extend sweeping human rights protections to LGBTQ people. Fairbanks Mayor Jim Matherly said he wanted to put the issue on the October ballot and let the people decide. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? It all started with a tweet that went viral. Mr. Rogers, the venerable children's TV host who told all of his young viewers that he liked them just the way they were, was apparently bisexual. A well-known YouTuber cited Maxwell King's 2018 biography, The Good Neighbor, The Life and Work of Fred Rogers. While he's not on record identifying as bisexual, Rogers did describe his sexual attraction as fluid. The revelation lit up the internet this week, with most queer friends celebrating, though a few hetero critics said it would have been inappropriate for children if Rogers' bisexuality had been known at the time. During conversations with openly gay Dr. William Hirsch, Rogers reportedly said that he's right smack in the middle of the Kinsey scale and said he found both men and women attractive. One queer tweet expressed surprise that, as a Presbyterian minister, Rogers ever stated anything so clearly. I do not find it hard to believe he was just that kind of a person, but I am delightfully shocked he ever said even that much. Rogers died in 2003, two years after his show ended, following more than three decades on the air. And finally, Michael McConnell and Jack Baker applied for and got a marriage license in Earth County, Minnesota, in 1971. The clerk didn't realize that both applicants were male. It made headlines around the world, even though authorities refused to recognize the marriage. The U.S. Supreme Court finally opened the civil institution to same-gender couples in 2015. But McConnell and Baker have spent the past five decades trying to get their marriage legally recognized. At long last, the McConnells, Jack took Michael's last name, received a letter in mid-February from the Social Security Administration officially validating their 1971 marriage. 
After 48 years of wedded bliss, they're now believed to be the most enduring legally married same-gender couple in the United States, and maybe in the world. That's News Wrap, global queer news with attitude, for the week ending March 9, 2019. Follow the news in your area and around the world. An informed community is a strong community. News Wrap is written by Gray Gordon, produced with Brian DeShazer, recorded at the studios of KPFK Los Angeles, and brought to you by you. Help keep us in ears around the world at the ever-updating thiswayout.org, where you can also read the text of this newscast. For This Way Out, I'm Carol Myers. And I'm Sarah Sweeney.